So in our team we are interested to apply biophysical methods to membrane proteins and membrane peptides. Uh, this has very important implications in many, many biomedical research areas like the field of antimicrobial peptides, but also how a signaling occurs through the membrane, how can molecules be transported through the membrane, especially large molecules like DNA, that for example in gene therapy to want to transport the DNA into the cell, so you have to pass the membrane or there's other signals that pass the membrane to have contact from the inside to the outside of the cell. And all this happens with, or a lot of these things happen with membranes, with proteins that are situated in the membranes or peptides. And so we want to study the structure of these more. So there's many biophysical techniques like optical spectroscopy, CD, infrared, we can get secondary structure, but one technique that is very po powerful is solid state NMR spectroscopy. So now probably you have heard about NMR spectroscopy a lot and you learned it in your courses and so on. It's a very uh, popular technique nowadays because it's so potent and has so many applications. But most people um, apply NMR in the liquid state and what happens is the molecules tumble very fast and that many interactions get averaged during time because the molecules move so fast. That's good because it gives you for one atom one signal and it's a sharp signal. And if the system gets bigger and bigger the, the peaks get broader and broader so there's a limit to that. That when there at that point solid state NMR steps in because that's a technique that has been developed for systems that are actually not moving, that are solid, right? And it's also NMR, but now things get more complicated. Because what we forget when we study solution NMR is that actually every interaction that we can me measure in NMR is orientation dependent. You have to imagine there is this big magnetic field of the NMR spectrometer that we always consider going from the floor to the ceiling, right? That's always standard, it's our convention. And so now you have a molecule, like my hand is this molecule. This molecule is oriented parallel to this magnetic field. And that gives you a chemical shift of a specific value. Let's say this is a protein and we have labeled it with nitrogen 15 one side. We're looking at this one side, it's nitrogen 15 labeled. And so if the if the uh, uh, peptide bond is oriented in such a way that the NH vector, so that's basically what you find every peptide bond, a nitrogen, and attached to this nitrogen there's a proton, a hydrogen. And this link, this bond is parallel to this magnetic field. Then you see a very high chemical shift, 200 ppm, it's very high. And then you, you sort of move this molecule in space and all of a sudden you move from 200 ppm all the way to 60 or 50. So it's a big effect, right? In, if you had this in a solution you would see uh, just a very around 10 ppm difference because of the chemical environment. So this is 10 times more just because of the orientation and all this is averaged out in solution but it's there in the solid state. And also if you have something like a gel or a membrane where is motion but not in all directions, motions are slow and so on. And so this is also true for other interactions that you don't even see in solution because they average to zero. Like there's dipolar interactions, there's quadrupolar interactions and all this all of a sudden becomes visible in the solid state and indirectly uh, may be present there in solution but you cannot directly observe it in the spectrum. And so basically it's annoying because if we have now a sample and all these orientations we get a very broad peak and we cannot resolve peaks anymore. So we have to think about what to do. And there's two ways we can, I mean there's two ways that are currently mostly used. One is to artificially introduce this movement and that is uh, we spin the sample around an axis very fast, like 20,000 times a second typically, something of that order of magnitude. And that way we start averaging things again. So if you have an interaction that's orientation dependent like that, you spin it around and then the average will be just along the, the rotation axis. Now 
there is something magic about that because if you think about it, all these interactions are cosine functions and they pass miraculously they pass through zero at some point. So you can find an angle if you think about this cosine that describes the size of the interaction as a function of the angle. At some angle all of a sudden this interaction becomes zero. And if you rotate around this angle then everything will collapse onto this direction and become zero and disappear from your spectrum. And that's why we call it magic angle sample spinning. And it's, it's a perfect method to introduce, to get spectrum that look almost like spectrum that could, you could obtain on solution. There's yet another approach and that is taking advantage of this angular dependency. So you can think if we manage to orient our sample with respect to the big magnetic field like that and then we have molecules in there that have a certain orientation that would show up as a single line in our spectrum. And from our spectrum now we, get or this, we can back calculate this angle or we can deduce some angular information. And that's what we do in our lab, for example, we take the, our membranes, we are interested in membrane proteins, and so we deposit these membranes on surfaces, and then we measure certain parameters in the NMR that allow us to deduce the orientation of this molecule, but we can also deduce by measuring several angles of several bonds, we can reconstruct the structure of a polypeptide where we don't know the structure, in uh, basic just from these angles and it's a very useful technique because there's very little techniques that allow you to determine uh, protein structures in a liquid crystalline bilayer so this bilayer is actually not a it's not rock solid but it's still it has this liquid crystal and this liquid properties things move in there like in nature in a normal bilayer things can move but still this angle sort of stays the same even if it moves right or it translates the angle will always stay the same relative to the magnetic field and that's what we can do with solid state NMR. So we have two techniques one is the magic angle sam sample spinning technique with this technique we can measure distances like in solution and we can also measure certain intermolecular angles like uh, dihedral angles for example and this allows us to reconstruct structures and uh, it's uh, a lot of teams have started this now in 2000 uh, the first structure of a protein uh, 2000 was resolved and it was published a few years later so this technique has become very uh, popular now because in the 1990s it was not considered a very useful technique for full structure determination people didn't believe in it but with this uh, proof that you can use the technique for structure determination, many more groups join the field and try to develop and things are much faster. So you can see it's only 10 years, it's only a few years that we work on this or that the uh, NMR community works on that. And uh, at first there was very few people, now there's many more teams and things evolve very fast. And so we think that at some point uh, we believe that it will be a very useful technique to do full membrane protein structures and indeed there are first examples, smaller proteins that have been resolved, so there's proof of concept. There has also been applications in the field of uh, fibers, you know, maybe that uh, Alzheimer's disease, people think that the fiber formation is very important for neurodegenerative diseases of various kinds. And so there is no uh, real other method to look at the structures of these fibers. And so solid state NMR has been used to look at these structures and do atom by atom uh, resolution of where the, uh, how these fibers form. And that's important if you want to develop a medication against it. If we use these oriented samples, of course, we get very, uh, very interesting additional information because we can also say the molecules not just the structure of the molecules, but we can also say how the molecule is oriented relative to the membrane. 
And uh, sometimes this was surprising. We had, for example, antimicrobial peptides where everyone thought they are going through, but they are actually sitting on the surface. And that has made us rethink how they function and what to do with these uh, peptides. We can also study dynamics, sort of. The spectra change a little bit if things move like that. We get a bit of averaging, which we can see of the spectra. We don't get the full averaging of this anisotropy, but just a bit, so we can use that to, to study dynamics. We can also, so um, yeah, that's very important in, in, in many living systems to have an idea about dynamics and structure topology dynamics, I would say. Why is solid state NMR hasn't been developed parallel to solution NMR, you may ask? Well, one problem is that the lines are so broad we didn't get the resolution that you automatically get in, in, uh, in this, uh, to get it in solution, but not automatically in the solid. So you have to take artificial means to get narrow lines, for example. And we also have much, we need more sample, and it's sometimes difficult for macro, bio macromolecules to have so much sample. So these are disadvantages. So I think the field will actually profit from novel technical developments. And these developments are, for example, signal enhancement techniques that uh, can be through pulse sequence, through bigger magnets, but also through what we call dynamic nuclear polarization, where we transfer polarization from electrons to the nuclei and make them much more intense in that way. Uh, there might be new things coming up, which we don't even think about, uh, but this is sort of a major hurdle. And if we can overcome this hurdle, I think it's a very promising, uh, it will promise in a very uh, fast way, uh, can, can, and could become a method generally applicable to membrane protein structure, for example. Now it's still difficult. It's hard to predict how these technical developments will come about. Conceptually, we know it's possible, but there, has be, there are certain hurdles to be overcome. There's already structures now coming up in, for fibrils. We have understood antimicrobial peptides much better with this technique. So there's many applications and uh, who knows what the future gives. <music>